Okay, so welcome to our webinar Wednesday in recognition of Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month, which is the month of September. Um, today's topic is Gynecologic Cancer 101. Um, just a few reminders, for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, please make sure that you remain muted when you're not speaking. Um, this webinar is being streamed to Facebook Live and will be uploaded later to YouTube. Uh, please use the chat box to ask questions during the presentation, and then we'll also have some time afterward um, for some Q&A if you want to unmute yourself. And for those of us, those of you who are uh, joining us on Facebook Live, please use the comments section on our Facebook Live post to ask any questions that you may have. The Webinar Wednesday series is uh, a program by the University of Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Center, Office of Community Engagement and Cancer Health Equity. Um, so this is our team. Our uh, office is the sort of the bridge between the University of Chicago Cancer Center and the uh, greater Chicago community. And we are so excited to bring this faculty expertise to everyone. Um, through the Webinar Wednesday series. Uh, my name is Aliyah Poulos and I'm an education outreach specialist in this office. And uh, on behalf of my office, I wanna welcome you all today to our webinar. Our speaker today is a friend of our office. She is wonderful, Dr. Katherine Kernett. Um, she is always ready to uh, share her expertise uh, with the community and we are just so grateful to her for that. And um, I'm gonna allow Dr. Kernett to introduce herself more um, and she will get started on the content of our presentation today. So welcome Dr. Kernett and thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thanks Aliyah, thanks for having me today. Um... Let me share my screen. All right, does this look right to everyone? Um, yes, although I can see, I think it's in like speaker mode or something or, or it, no, I can kind of see the next, yeah. Let me start. Let me see. Is that better? Yes, definitely. Okay, I'm just turning off. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen. No problem. One more time. All right, that looks okay. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, very good. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. My name is Katie Kernett. I'm one of the GYN oncology docs at the University of Chicago. Um, I, um, within gynecologic oncology, uh, we are kind of a unique subset of um, cancer care in that we are trained through OBGYN and we do both surgery and chemotherapy, but just for a smaller subset of cancer. So um, when I was asked to give this talk, um, we realized this was the first day of gynecologic cancer awareness month. So I'm using this just sort of as a very broad overview of gynecologic cancers. This will probably be very basic for many of you, but I do wanna just use this opportunity to remind us all of kind of the nuts and bolts and the basics and some things that always are worth revisiting. Um, and so please ask questions. I may not be able to see the chat box, but um, if someone wants to just interrupt me and if there's a chat uh, question that comes in, let me know. And then I'm gonna leave a lot of time for questions at the end, because I really do wanna make this useful and interesting for you all as much as possible. So um, with that, let's get started. So a few objectives for today are first to review screening for GYN cancers to describe some of the symptoms of gynecologic cancers, and then to discuss treatment of gynecologic cancers. And I'm gonna be talking in very broad terms. These are obviously very um, you know, extensive uh, topics. There's a lot of nuance, there's a lot of upcoming research and a lot of stuff that's already been done, but I just wanna to try to hit some of the highlights. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of background just to make sure we're all on the same page. So what are the gynecologic cancers that um, I treat and that we're gonna be talking about? So first is, um, here's kind of a, an old anatomy lesson, um, but this is basically a summary of all of the um, cancers that I would be, you know, a gynecologic oncologist would treat. So you've got here the uterus, 
in the body of the uterus. At the bottom of the uterus is the cervix. So the cervix is actually part of the uterus, but is sort of separate in terms of its cells and how we think about cancers there. Um, this all sits at the top of the vagina, which some people will refer, refer to as sort of the birth canal. And then outside of the vagina, sort of between the inner thigh and the vagina is what we call the vulva. Um, Outside of the uterus are these ovaries. The ovaries are actually separate from the uterus, but there are these attachments and blood vessels that connect them. And then the fallopian tubes sit on top of the ovaries, um, but are actually a part of the uterus. So this here kind of encompasses the, the extent of the cancers that I would primarily um, treat and what we're gonna talk about today. The most common being these three. So uterine, or sometimes we'll call these, the most common type is endometrial. Um, ovarian or fallopian tube cancers. Um, this, there's also a primary peritoneal cancer that falls under the same umbrella. And then cervical cancer, this part at the bottom of the uterus. This is also a common one that we'll see with um, um, when we're talking about gynecologic cancers. Less common would be vulvar cancer, so on the outside um, of the female anatomy, and then vaginal cancers kind of between the cervix and the vulva. And we're talking about actual numbers of new cases. Uterine is by far the most common. This part up here, this endometrial cancer will account for about 66,000 this um, in the year of 20, uh, 2021, kind of estimated. Ovarian is next with about 21,000 new cases and cervical is lagging behind in the US um, in large part because of many, many efforts over the last decades that we've been able to really decrease this um, the number of new cases each year at about 14,000. Um, less common will be vulvar cancers um, and vaginal cancers, both of which are less common, but still issues that um, you know, are worth discussing. I'm gonna focus mostly on these top three because these are the ones we will see. And I think it is also important to note that in the US, these are the numbers for cervical cancer, but in terms of worldwide um, new cases, the number is much higher. In the US, we have access to screening and treatment of pre-cancers. Um, and also the HPV vaccine, but that is um, not true in all parts of the world. And so these numbers would look different if you looked in other locations. All right, so I'm gonna first take a minute and talk about screening um, and then talk about how this applies to these cancers. But I think the first thing to note about screening is that the idea behind screening is that you are identifying cancers before there are symptoms. So if you already have symptoms, it's not really screening. Screening um, has made a big difference in terms of cancer diagnoses. You can theoretically find cancers earlier if you're screening people who do not have symptoms yet. One of the best non-gynecologic um, examples would be like mammograms for breast cancer or colonoscopies for colon cancer. Those are tests that we would do on people who don't have symptoms, but who go in for routine testing to try to identify these cancers early. So that's kind of the background of screening is to find things before there are symptoms. So let's first talk about cervical cancer. This is the most straightforward and the easiest. And many of you probably know this, but the best screening that we have is pap tests. Um, and there are different components to it, but when we say a pap test, we're talking about both the cells, that how they look under the microscope, as well as the HPV testing. So a pap test is physically done by um, doing a speculum exam, so using an instrument that will help us see the cervix in the, um, we can do this in the clinic, and then using one of these brushes or spatulas to just gently collect some of the cells that are free floating on the cervix. So it's not a, a pinch of tissue, it's, no, um, it's not a biopsy of anything, it's just taking the cells that are already there and just brushing them off and then putting them into this um, liquid here. And then it goes to our cytologist or our pathologist and they take the um, liquid and the cells and they put them on a slide and smear them, so to speak, which is why it used to be called a pap smear. Um, and you can see the cells here and they have all this extensive training to evaluate um, what, what is normal, what is abnormal, what is cancer, what is normal, and what is pre-cancer. Because one of the things that makes pap tests and screening useful is that you can find patients not only who have cancer, but also in those pre-cancerous phases that you can treat and potentially prevent a cancer from developing. So cervical cancer has a good screening test, and that is the pap test. And there are these two components looking at the cells and checking for the HPV virus, um, human papillomavirus, testing is now kind of standard practice and most GYNs and um, primary care docs are doing this. All right, what about uterine cancer? Um, so unfortunately there really is not a good screening test for uterine cancer. Um, 
pap tests do not screen for uterine cancer, do not screen for endometrial cancer. But the caveat is that sometimes pap tests will accidentally find a uterine cancer. So if you remember that picture of the anatomy, the endometrium is inside the uterus, those cells can sometimes come down through and go onto the cervix. And so if you're just brushing some free cells, you might catch endometrial or uterine cancer cells. That is not the goal. And so plenty of patients that I've seen will say, but I've had pap tests every year or every five years or every three years as recommended. How did this happen? And the answer is that pap tests were never designed to screen for anything other than cervical cancer. And so they will not necessarily catch a uterine cancer. We'll come back to this point. Um, in a, in a little bit. And what about ovarian cancer? Um, so unfortunately, there's also no good screening test for this. And this is a little bit more problematic than endometrial cancer because ovarian cancer is much less, um, less easy to diagnose. Um, and so for this reason, because ovarian cancer in many ways is more serious than uterine cancer kind of on a population level, we have tested all sorts of different strategies. So we've looked at ultrasounds, we've looked at blood tests, we've looked at new blood tests, we've looked at combinations of ultrasounds and blood tests. And kind of all of these things have basically shown that we still don't have a good screening strategy for ovarian cancer. And part of the reason is not that you maybe wouldn't be able to see an ovarian mass or an ovarian cancer on an ultrasound. It's just that a screening test is most useful if you're not finding a lot of people who have um, non-cancer. So if your false positive rate is low, that screening test is better. The problem is that if we see something on an ultrasound or a blood test shows that there might be an ovarian cancer, the next step is a pretty big one, and that's a surgery. And so we always have to balance out the pros and cons of finding something and then having to treat it and then dealing with the potential risks from that secondary workup testing procedure down the way. So the bottom line for ovarian cancer, there really is also no good screening test. The PAP test definitely does not catch this. Um, and so this is something that is a big area of future research and interest and kind of progress that we need to make. So let's take the next step forward. So that was screening. So screening is looking again at people, um, patients who do not have any symptoms, but let's talk about what symptoms there are that we can watch for. So let's first start with uterine cancer. This is the easiest one um, to kind of describe. And the one where symptom monitoring, I think, has the best success rates. So for uterine cancer, it's basically because it's coming from the endometrium in most cases, most patients will report abnormal uterine bleeding. So if it's before menopause, that means that maybe their cycles are irregular. Maybe they're not coming every 26 to 28 days. Maybe they are heavier than usual. Maybe they're lasting longer. Something has changed over time. Maybe they've skipped a cycle. Um, so abnormal uterine bleeding in general is the biggest symptom of uterine cancer and is um, a pretty reliable um, finding for many people who are ultimately diagnosed with uterine cancer. Abnormal discharge sometimes can um, go along with this. Sometimes it looks bloody, sometimes it just looks different, um, but that should kind of warrant a discussion with a gynecologist. And then pelvic pain is not as reliably related to uterine cancer, but certainly patients with uterine cancer can have pelvic pain. So I think the big take home from this is that any bleeding that anyone is having after menopause is considered to be abnormal and should be evaluated. And I say this because I see um, patients sometimes who will tell me, well, but it only happened one time, or um, I figured my periods just restarted because it hadn't been, it only been a couple of years. I just think that bottom line take home should be that any vaginal bleeding after menopause is abnormal. It does not mean that all bleeding after menopause is cancer, but it means that it should be worked up. Like don't, um, don't, overthink it or talk yourself out of it, go see a gynecologist because this should be worked up to make sure that we don't miss something. Because uterine cancer, the reason we diagnose it in general very early and we can cure it is because people have symptoms very early and that symptom is primarily abnormal bleeding. So we take this very seriously. The second one is ovarian cancer. And this one is not quite as satisfying because I've already told you we don't have a screening test for it. The problem is that these symptoms um, are not, um, not quite as straightforward as for uterine cancer. So bloating, um, abdominal distension, some patients will tell me that their pants stopped fitting right, that it was just all in their belly. Um, sometimes it's abdominal pain or pelvic pain, changes in appetite, um, feeling full early. 
bowel changes, like new constipation, all of those can kind of go along with many patients who have ovarian cancer. The problem is that many patients without ovarian cancer may also have these symptoms. And so I think a lot of folks will talk themselves out of it, or even some doctors will sort of say, well, let's try these things and then reevaluate because it is very nonspecific. So it's harder here to have a good take home message. But I do think that especially for folks after menopause, if you are having some of these symptoms, bloating, distension, pain, changes in appetite, maybe even weight loss or kind of changes in um, your hunger or how much you can eat, bowel changes, I think it's worth a discussion with your physician. Um, and if these persist, I do think that they should be worked up. Um, it's really tough, but um, I do think that this is worth mentioning because ovarian cancer is kind of the hardest cancer that we treat because it is not able to be screened and there are no really good specific symptoms that we can watch for. All right, last is cervical cancer. And so here are some of the ones that go along with this. Again, some irregular vaginal bleeding. A common complaint is bleeding after intercourse because the, if there's a, an area on the cervix, a tumor on the cervix, that could be irritated during intercourse. Vaginal discharge that's different or persistent or foul smelling in some way not normal for that patient can be a sign. And then pelvic pain. These are kind of symptoms of earlier stage a lot of times, um, but at the very earliest stage, there may not be symptoms. And this is where pap tests are really important because pap tests will find cancers or precancers before any of this happens. And that's why it's a good screening test it's because you can see abnormal cells before there are enough there to cause some of these symptoms. So in, in general, these are some of the cervical cancer symptoms, but we hope that um, we don't see these because the PAP test should be doing, um, doing its job. All right, so that was screening and symptoms. Now let's talk about diagnosis. So let's say someone comes and sees me and they're having some of these symptoms and I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. How do we make a diagnosis for some of these cancers? So all of them, all of the cancers that I'm talking about and probably most cancers out there, especially solid tumors or ones that aren't from the blood, um, most of these will require a pathology diagnosis. So that means that um, you need some sort of tissue or biopsy or sampling, and that usually comes in the form of one of these two things. So there's either a surgery to remove a mass or to take out um, something abnormal, or there's a biopsy, which is still a procedure, but it's taking a much smaller amount of tissue. And this can often be done not in the operating room. This can be done in a clinic or this can be done by um, a specialized radiologist. So there are different ways you can do it. But at the end of the day, the cancers that I deal with require some sort of pathology diagnosis. Physical exam, imaging, labs, all these things help me. They help me kind of weigh out the likelihood that it's a cancer or give me a comment about um, what, what type of cancer it might be or how aggressive it might be. But at the end of the day, you cannot make a diagnosis without actual tissue. And that's why um, a lot of times if you see a doctor, you get a second opinion. A lot of times we spend a lot of energy trying to get the actual slides and looking at them um, ourselves or having them reviewed because this can make a big difference in terms of treatment. It all comes down to pathology. So let's talk kind of... Um, kind of in a bigger picture sense. So going back to this initial anatomy um, picture here. So again, uterus, cervix, ovaries, tubes, vagina, vulva. Um, the one that's the most common biopsy that we can do in the clinic would be an endometrial biopsy. And I bring this up because it goes back to that idea that for endometrial cancer or uterine cancer, we don't have a good screening test, but we still often successfully diagnose this at a very early stage and cure it because we can have patients come in with symptoms and do a biopsy kind of in pretty quick progression. So the biopsy of this endometrial lining, this inside of the uterus, is done usually with a catheter. This can be done in the clinic. So we use that speculum, that instrument to see the cervix. And then we would place this catheter through the vagina, through the cervix, into the endometrial cavity, into the uterine cavity here, um, kind of through this area. And then you use suction to take out some of the, um, the cells that are lining this endometrial um, area here. And so with this, we pull out some cells and then that goes to the pathologist and then they have tissue and they can give us an actual diagnosis. This is something that's important because we can do this in the clinic. You can do this. It's very um, 
it is uncomfortable for many people, but it is um, not as major a surgery or major intervention as a surgery. For patients who cannot tolerate this in the clinic, um, which does occasionally happen, we can also do this in the operating room. And this is something called like a dilation and curatage, which just means using a different instrument, to, but to functionally sample this lining here too. So um, endometrial cancer, endometrial biopsies, all of these are very um, kind of the most straightforward way to do a diagnosis. But let's say this was a cervical cancer. There would be potentially like a, a mass here or something abnormal or a tumor on the cervix that you could see. There are also biopsy, um, what we call forceps or an instrument to take a, a, a piece of the tissue that's there in the clinic as well and have the pathologist look at it. So not all biopsies need to go to the operating room. A lot of them can be done by a gynecologist or gynecologic oncologist or even some primary care doctors. Okay, so um, that's diagnosis. You need tissue. It's either a surgery or a biopsy of some way, but they need to actually be able to look at some of the cells to make a firm um, diagnosis. So now we're last, I'm gonna sort of end on treatment. And of course, treatment is, um, this is probably the most complex because this is a sort of an open-ended thing and it's very um, personalized based on each patient and each experience and diagnosis and kind of all the other things that go into shaping decisions. Um, but I'm gonna try to give you a broad overview of what cancer treatment might include and what the most common treatment types are for these types of cancers. Um, and if anyone wants more detail or has specific questions, I'm happy to answer those too, but I'm gonna talk in very broad terms just to kind of give us an intro to cancer treatment. So the first overview is to kind of talk about the different modalities. When I see a patient, they've been diagnosed with one of the cancers that I treat, I say that these are the three main ways that we treat most cancers. Some of them just use one, some of them use two, some of them use all three, but these are kind of our main treatment approaches that we use to try to treat and cure cancers. Um, and so surgery, there are different types of surgeries we can do, but many of them will boil down to whether it's an open surgery, which means a big incision on the abdomen to look inside, or a minimally invasive, which is a laparoscopic or robotic way that we use smaller incisions to try to do the surgery um, without making such a large incision. And there are different nuances to when you can do one or the other and things to consider. But in general, those are the two major ways that we would use surgery. Um, chemotherapy, I, I just put this in here. I, I'm, I know most of you know this, but there are a lot of different regimens. And I say that because I see a lot of patients who were starting about or were talking about starting chemotherapy and they'll have heard horror stories from a friend or they'll have so like when my colleague got chemotherapy, this happened, whatever it was happened, whether it was good or bad. And I say this, that there are a lot of different regimens because when people say they got chemo, that can mean many, many, many different things. And so I think um, it's really helpful to hear from friends and family and patients about their experience. But I think you also need to remember that your experience is going to be different and it's going to depend completely on what treatments, what chemotherapies are actually going to be used. Um, and so chemotherapy broadly is used, but is tailored to each specific situation. And then radiation, um, I said I do surgery and chemo. I do not personally do radiation, but I work very closely with the radiation oncologists both here and in the community. And there are different types of radiation in very broad terms. There's external radiation um, and internal. And so radiation, what it is, is basically taking high dose x-rays and using those to um, penetrate through the other tissues and kill off the cancer cells. So external means that basically the x-rays are coming from the outside. I, I say x-rays kind of colloquially, but the radiation is coming from the outside and treating the cancer cells inside. Internal or what we call brachytherapy means that you're putting it kind of right next to that tumor. So if it's in the cervix, you're putting a, a device right next to the cervix or right next to the endometrium to give high dose radiation right next to it, rather than going outside in and um, kind of potentially hitting all those other structures, you are right next to it. And it gives you the ability to use a higher dose treatment um, while kind of not affecting the surrounding structures quite as much. Um, and this is really important for certain types of cancers that we treat, but most, many cancers will use a combination of both of these, but some will just use one or the other. All right, so let's first talk about ovarian cancer, very broad strokes of ovarian cancer treatment at at diagnosis, usually include surgery and chemotherapy. Unfortunately, most ovarian cancer is diagnosed at a later stage, so at a stage three or stage four, and that goes back to what we talked about, about 
a lack of screening and also kind of nonspecific symptoms. And so at stage three or stage four, most people will get a combination of surgery and chemotherapy. And this, um, this has been shown in our literature to be important to get both. We know patients will do best if they have a combination of both of these things. But kind of the nuances of this are that um, the order that we do surgery and chemotherapy depends on the situation um, that that patient is experiencing. For some patients, what we used to do much more is we would do surgery at the beginning, do a big procedure to try to remove all the cancer that we could see, and then from there, give chemotherapy. But what we now know is that it's uh, potentially, that it is safe and potentially more um, well tolerated, better tolerated, if we do a few cycles of chemotherapy first, shrink the cancer down, then do a surgery and then come back and give more chemotherapy. And so that's sort of part of the discussion that takes into account um, a lot of factors at the beginning of treatment. But in general, for ovarian cancer, when it is first diagnosed, most patients will have a combination of these two things in some order. All right, let's talk about uterine cancer or endometrial cancer. Um, the big way that this is treated um, is with surgery. And this goes back to what we talked about screening. There is no screening, but symptoms are very clear for many people. Um, abnormal vaginal bleeding brings people into an office at which time they can do a biopsy. And overall, the vast majority of endometrial cancers are going to be diagnosed at stage one or at an early stage. And that means that for many people, surgery will cure them. So surgery is almost always the route that we will start. There are some nuances where that's not true, but in general, surgery is where we'll start for endometrial cancer. And then based on the surgery and the pathology review that we get from there, then we decide, do you need chemotherapy after? Do you need radiation after? What type of radiation would you need? Do you need both chemotherapy and radiation? Or do you just need surgery and that's it? Um, so most of the time, um, it's surgery first, but not always. And sometimes um, you'll get chemotherapy or radiation instead or both, um, but sometimes it's also sequential. So in general, this is a very heavily surgery treated one, but there are other modalities that will add it as well. And last is cervical cancer. And this is the one that I think has the most, um, the most variation perhaps. Um, in terms of early cervical cancer, so many people who come in who have a pap test and the pap test is abnormal and ultimately shows a cancer, but it's very early, it's very small. Most of these very early stage, stage one um, tumors can be treated with surgery. So surgery is sometimes our go-to for cervical cancer in very certain settings. The type of surgery is what we call um, a radical hysterectomy for many people. So it's a little bit more extensive and a little bit different than what we do for uterine cancer. And that's why getting the diagnosis right is really important. But in general, there are some patients with cervical cancer whose surgery is the best treatment um, to start with. However, this is one of those that there is also another big subset of patients whose surgery is not the right answer. Um, and that radiation and or chemotherapy might actually be the best way to treat patients with cervical cancer. And this depends on the stage. This depends on what all the um, imaging tests show. It depends on the examination. It depends on you know, other health problems and things like that. But we now have pretty good research that shows that there are some patients whose surgery is not only not helpful, but may be harmful, and that patients will do better in terms of both um, prognosis and um, ability to cure cancer, but also in terms of quality of life if we do radiation and chemo without doing surgery. And I think this is a really hard thing for a lot of folks to wrap their head around because the obvious you know, first gut instinct is there's a cancer in me and I want it out. But we know that if we do that for all patients who have cervical cancer, that that will be the wrong um, kind of treatment for a large subset of patients. So I think this is where it's really important, one, that we get a biopsy or a tissue diagnosis, um, but that does not necessarily mean a surgery initially, getting a diagnosis, getting potentially a CT scan or a PET scan or an MRI, maybe getting lab tests, and then using that to guide, should we move forward with that surgery or do we need to switch gears and really focus on trying to cure this cancer with 
radiation and possibly chemotherapy on top of it. And so I think between these three cancer types, ovarian, uterine, cervical, they kind of highlight the spectrum of different approaches to different cancers. And that's why when, you know, when we talk about cancer care in general, there are so many nuances and differences depending on um, what, where the cancer started and how it's behaving that it's hard to say that there's just one specific treatment. And so all of these are all based on kind of the workup and the discussion that we have along that whole um, kind of pathway of diagnosis. Um, and then I guess as I just put this in here to remind myself that there are cases here that will also do radiation after surgery or chemotherapy after surgery, some combination. All right, so um, that's about all I wanted to say, but here are a few take home points, starting with cervical cancer. This is preventable in that you can be screened for it. So I encourage everybody to see your primary care doctor, gynecologist. Um, if you have a cervix, you should potentially be getting screened at least um, for a good portion of your life. Um, and for, especially for younger folks, um, getting the HPV vaccine is really important. So, um, this is now approved up through age 45, but we know the best benefit is going to be um, before people become, before um, children and young adults most often become sexually active. If we can get the HPV vaccine there. Cervical cancer is almost um, exclusively related to HPV. And so if we can prevent the virus, we can potentially prevent cervical cancer. So cervical cancer, preventable, do your screening tests and get the vaccine when possible. Uterine cancer, we do not have good screening, but any abnormal bleeding, specifically any bleeding after menopause is abnormal. It warrants a discussion with your doctor, with your provider, be, be evaluated, probably will need some sort of testing, whether it's a biopsy or an ultrasound, but some workup should be done if there's any bleeding after menopause. And then ovarian cancer, this is the hardest one in my mind. There is no screening. Um, there's no good way to, to reliably find this um, before there are symptoms. But the only thing I can really say here is that in general, but especially in relation to ovarian cancer, if something doesn't seem right, be persistent, talk to your doctor, bring it up, say this has been going on, this is not normal for me. And especially as women get past, um, as patients are past menopause, um, if you're noticing that there's increased bloating or distension or um, your clothes are just fitting differently or something is odd, just I think it's always worth worth bringing up because there may be other testing that we should do. That's all I have, but I would like to open it up and answer any questions um, uh, that anyone may have. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kernett. That was, that was perfect. That was a great overview of all the different kinds of gynecologic cancers, um, and that was really great. Um, so I've been, a few people have messaged me questions directly, um, so I'm going to do those and then um, uh, we have uh, a couple questions in the chat here too. So um, the first question I have here is, are there any lifestyle risk factors for any of these cancers? Like anything that, that people can do to, you know, uh, behaviors or things that they can do on their own to try to prevent them? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, the most well-established risk factors, um, one would be for endometrial cancer or uterine cancer. A lot of these are, we, I didn't really get into why they happen, but a lot of these are related to an imbalance of estrogen and progesterone. And so when you have high levels of estrogen, that can cause the uterine lining to grow kind of out of control. And when things grow kind of without that control, that's when cells become abnormal and can eventually become a cancer. So the biggest um, cause for excess estrogen in the U.S. at least tends to be obesity and being overweight. We know that the fat cells kind of in our body will create estrogen. So even after your ovaries stop working at menopause, that uh, the fat cells in your body will create extra estrogen and this can act on the uterus and cause that lining to grow without regulation. So I think that um, weight and obesity is a big one for endometrial cancer. Um, cervical cancer, we know that most of these are related to um, HPV. So um, the biggest lifestyle one there, I would say, is the HPV vaccine. I know that's not really a lifestyle change, but I, you know what I usually say is that HPV is incredibly prevalent. For people who are sexually active, you 
probably are going to be exposed to HPV at some time. We do not have a good rationale um, or understanding of why some people will get the HPV vaccine and get rid of it or get the HPV virus and get rid of it. Their body will naturally clear it and why others they'll get it and they'll never be able to clear it. And then it will eventually potentially become a cancer. And so I think that for cervical cancer, getting the vaccine is kind of the most important lifestyle thing that you can do. Um, and then for ovarian cancer, it's a lot tougher. There are a lot of um, nuances for, um, for, for ovarian cancer, like there's, you know, the whole baby powder and Johnson and Johnson lawsuit, and all of that. There are kind of associations between things that I would say the biggest thing there is um, family history and genetic mutation. So if you have a BRCA mutation or if you have other kind of less common, but also associated with ovarian cancers, those ones are kind of the biggest thing that you can do um, would be to know your family history, know that information, and then potentially there are risk reducing strategies that you can implement and potentially screen for. Right, thank you for that. Um, do these cancers have effects on fertility, either the cancers or the treatments? And are there ways to preserve your fertility if you- Oh, that's a great a question, yeah. So fertility um, is less commonly, uh, I'll start from like the, the one that is least commonly an issue in is ovarian cancer. Most patients with ovarian cancer will be postmenopausal, so it's less of a concern, but I do occasionally see younger patients who desire to have um, children and are diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So depending on the situation, sometimes it's possible to do a surgery, but leave an ovary or and or a, the uterus behind and just take the one that's affected. Um, it's not always possible, but sometimes that's an option. Um, a lot of times for folks who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer, any of these cancers will have them see an infertility specialist so that they can talk about strategies for preserving fertility or, you know, what the options are, like the broad umbrella of fertility in terms of carrying your own pregnancy or someone else carrying a pregnancy for you, having it be genetically yours or your partner's or, you know, all of those different nuances I think are worth discussing. For endometrial cancer, there are some, um, we are now um, more often using what we call fertility sparing or strategies that will allow fertility to still happen. So because I, as I said, the estrogen is usually the problem. What we do is we treat these with higher dose progesterones. And so that's a lot of times will be like an intrauterine device is the most popular one, I would say, at least in this day and age, but there are also oral progestins that sometimes will be used. And a lot of times that can slow the cancer down and eventually get it to go back to normal for long enough that we can work on kind of doing a, having, having a pregnancy or doing that next step, um, knowing that down the way, there is a good chance that eventually you will need to lose your uterus, um, but at least it buys a little bit of time. Cervical cancer, I think, is kind of a, an interesting one because, as I said, that cervix is just the bottom part of the uterus. So there are um, surgeries that we do where we just remove the cervix and extra tissue there, but leave the uterus behind. It's called a trachelectomy, and that's become um, fairly common. Um, and so there are like surgical ways we can manage it. A lot of these treatments, radiation, many chemotherapies, and obviously some surgeries will prevent pregnancy in the future. And so that is a really important discussion to have kind of when you're first diagnosed. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question here. It says for ovarian cancer, would a PET scan be helpful before sending someone to surgery? And are the CT and MRI not able to give a better view of the abnormality? That's a very good question. So, um, this is where we get into a somewhat um, complicated discussion of how like healthcare runs and how decisions are made and things. Um, so for ovarian cancer, as I said, the diagnosis is made with, um, with surgery. And so because you don't, for many people, there are some instances where you can do a biopsy, but there are many instances where you cannot for ovarian cancer and you have to end up getting a surgery. The PET scan has not borne out to be quite as helpful in ovarian cancer as it has in some other ones. It doesn't mean that we don't use it sometimes, but usually for many patients, all they'll need is the CT scan, which will see many abnormalities, and then the surgery, because the surgery is going to get a lot of the um, detail that potentially might be missed by CT and potentially even missed by a PET scan. So um, it's used less often, at least in the first first diagnosis of ovarian cancer, but sometimes people will use it later on down the way if needed. Um, I, a lot of the decision-making around what imaging we use is guided by 
these national cancer guidelines that we many of us will follow. So NCCN or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, I think, is a big one that a lot of us will use and kind of deciding whether the care that you're providing is quality and evidence based kind of follows those guidelines. And so for ovarian cancer, those guidelines don't recommend starting with a PET scan. In most cases, obviously, there are caveats to that, but most don't start with a PET scan. They'll usually start with a CT scan and potentially the surgery. Um, next question here, should postmenopausal women continue to get pap smears? Yes, yes. So the current guidelines, the, the guidelines right now in the last 10 years, there are maybe 10, 15 years, there have been a lot of changes. Um, and so I think there's a lot of confusion out there about who should be getting pap tests, how often they should be getting pap tests, when do you start, when do you stop? This has been a moving target. And to make matters worse, there are like multiple different organizations that are all recommending different things. So this, they're not like wildly different, but they're a little bit different. And I think at least to some confusion. So um, postmenopausal women should keep getting pap smears. Um, many of the guidelines will say that at the age of 65, that you should have a discussion about whether to continue pap tests if everything has always been normal before that. But for most women who go through menopause, average age is around 51. That's still about 15 years of postmenopausal life that still should be evaluated with pap tests and cervical cancer screening. So there are many nuances to who needs to get screened for how long, but a lot of the guidelines, if, they, if, if you're going to stop, a lot of them will use age 65 as sort of that cutoff. Okay, and um, I have a question here that says, why don't um, OBGYNs do more hysterectomies to prevent cervical and uterine cancers? Yep, that is a good question. So um, there are two parts to that. One is that um, whenever we do a treatment, whether it's a surgery or chemo or radiation or even a medication, whatever we're doing, everything has risks and benefits. Um, and for hysterectomies, in general, this is, this is why I trained. This is what all of us are trained to do. But there will still be situations where complications happen. And so you can imagine that if everyone just has a hysterectomy, um, whether or not it's actually needed or guided by a, a current issue, um, there will be some patients who have devastating com consequences. That number will be low, but it's high enough, you know, it's not zero, that that risk benefit ratio doesn't necessarily make sense. And then you can also get into a lot of things that it's not my expertise, but people talk about um, like cost benefit and kind of the weighing out the cost of something to not only to the patient, but to the healthcare system and to society that becomes a little bit um, grayer and there are cutoffs that people use. But it's, I would say in my mind, the reason that I don't just do hysterectomies on everybody who walks in the door is because there are risks to surgery and we do not ever take surgery lightly. And so we want to make sure that when we do a surgery, God forbid something you know, untoward happens or something that we weren't expecting happens, we want to make sure that we were making the right, that we were, our, our heart, so to speak, was in the right place when we went to the operating room in the first place. Um, the second issue, this is a very like kind of nuanced interpretation, but for cervical cancers, the issue is HPV. And so even if you take your cervix out, that HPV can still impact the vagina. So it does decrease your chances of getting a cervical cancer, but it's still that HPV is still the problem and can still have um, impacts on the reproductive tract, even if the uterus is out. Um, and so that, that probably weighs into some of the like risk benefit or cost benefit kind of discussions there. Okay, our next question here, why isn't vaginal ultrasound used as a routine screening method for endometrial cancer? Yeah, so, um, it most likely comes down to, um, in some in some way, it's um, false positive rates. Although, like I, that number isn't, I don't think, too high. This is um, for ultrasound. It's less helpful for endometrial cancer before menopause. Before menopause, it's really tough to interpret an ultrasound because the endometrial lining will naturally vary throughout the cycle. So at the beginning to the middle to the end that is going to fluctuate naturally. So it's a little bit harder to use ultrasound in that situation. We sometimes use it, but you have to, it's harder to interpret. The real question here, I think is probably for postmenopausal women where we do know that there is a cutoff above which for many patients that is um, 
considered to be abnormal and the risk of cancer goes up. Now there are still false positives. So that cutoff is usually around four millimeters, um, but let's say it's six millimeters or seven millimeters. Mo many of those patients will still not have cancer. So it's, even though the test is positive, the actual diagnosis is negative. So it would be a false positive. And so this gets back into, you know, if you're doing um, routine screening in patients who are asymptomatic, you're going to end up doing a lot of interventions that aren't ultimately necessary. Um, and so that risk benefit and the cost benefit analysis kind of says that this doing routine screening of ultrasounds is not helpful for average risk women. Now this can be, um, you know, the other issue with, or the other point about endometrial cancer is I told you that most women will, or most patients will have symptoms. You will have vaginal bleeding that's irregular or abnormal or postmenopausal, and that will lead you to the office. Almost all, like 80% or so of these endometrial cancers are diagnosed at stage one and are able to be cured. So there's also not as much use for doing the um, ultrasound because when you know, people will have symptoms pretty soon after the cancer is there. So it's a little bit less helpful to, we don't need to move it up too much because the cancer is already diagnosable. Um, but I would say that, or already treatable and curable, but I would say more of the um, issue probably lies around the false positive rate and the over-treating of people who don't necessarily need interventions. Um, okay, and our next question, can you get a gynecologic cancer after a full hysterectomy if you have your ovaries? Yep, this is a good question. This comes up a fair amount. So um, when we talk about hysterectomy, the hysterectomy just means removal of the uterus, okay? Um, if you do a total hysterectomy, what, what doctors and surgeons call a total hysterectomy, that means removing the uterus and the cervix. If we do a super cervical hysterectomy, what people sometimes call a subtotal hysterectomy, although we don't use that term because it's not very specific, that's removing the uterus but leaving the cervix. Hysterectomy as a term does not cover removal of the ovaries or technically the tubes. So if you're removing the tubes, then it would be a salpingectomy. Or if you're removing the ovaries, it would be an oophorectomy. And so if you have a total abdominal hysterectomy, so removal of the uterus and cervix and your ovaries and potentially your tubes are left behind, you can absolutely still get a gynecologic cancer because those ovaries can still get cancer or the tubes could still get cancer. Um, and that also, you know, we talked about them being rare, but vaginal cancer, vulvar cancer, those are still there because you still have your vagina and your vulvar tissue. So um, you definitely can still get a gynecologic cancer after um, a hysterectomy, even after it total abdominal hysterectomy, so uterus and cervix, and what we call a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, which is a big mouthful for removing both tubes and both ovaries in addition to the uterus and cervix, you even still can get some of these ovarian cancer-like um, cancers because they're, um, they can arise from the, they can start in the lining of the abdomen called the peritoneum. So that would be primary peritoneal cancer, it's rare, but it does still happen. And I think this really underscores the importance of even if you've had your uterus, excuse me, your uterus and cervix and or your other reproductive organs removed, it's still important to see a gynecologist and make sure you're doing kind of general gynecologic care because there are other things that may potentially um, need to be evaluated. Well, I'm muted. Okay, so um, thank you so much for answering all those amazing questions, really, really thoughtful questions that we got yeah, in the chat really box here. Questions. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat box and I just, oh, here's one. Um, when would you do a hysterectomy and not a total hysterectomy? Yeah, great question. So um, this was much more popular in prior decades. So we used to think um, that if you leave the cervix behind, there may be some benefit for sexual function. There have been subsequent research studies that show that that doesn't seem to really be the case. So we don't, um, we no longer think that leaving the cervix is important for sexual function. I think the case that I still have occasionally seen it is when there are certain, um, if you're having a hysterectomy and it's not for a cancer, you're having it because, um, uh, maybe it's bleeding or maybe it's, it's some other indication, but not a cancer reason. And you also are having like a urogynecologic procedure. So trying to fix prolapse or kind of, um, kind of suspend the vaginal vault for a non-cancer reason. Sometimes they will leave the cervix in to try to 
you know, use it to pivot it or to, to kind of support it. Um, that is less commonly done, but still, it's still sometimes done. And so it would never, for the purposes of a gynecologic cancer, there are very few instances when you would do a hysterectomy, but not a total hysterectomy, like taking the uterus, but not the cervix. It's pretty rare in gynecologic cancers, except in like certain, like very specific settings. A good question. Okay. Any other questions for for Dr. Kernet? You can um, you can type them in the chat, or you can just for those of you who are on Zoom, you can just unmute yourself and ask. Um, I'm not seeing any more come in on Facebook Live. And this is my um, that's my email. If anyone has questions, you can reach out. I'm sometimes better than others at email, but um, if you have questions, so. I'm I'm happy to try to um, field them for you because this is really important to me, and I hope that um, we all are able to kind of learn a little bit more about gynecologic cancers this month. Awesome, and I will make sure to, to share your email um, with all of our participants um, as well. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Kernet, huge, huge thank you. You are a gem. You are always willing to talk to our, our community constituents and our UChicago constituents about, um, about all things gynecologic cancer. So we just really appreciate you being here today and answering all those great questions. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you to all of uh, uh, all of you who joined us on Facebook Live. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.